Well, thank you very much, Barry. Um, I wish you hadn't reminded me of rejoice, rejoice, rejoice. <laughs> I, was, I was really embarrassed at the time. Um, it was said in a very strident voice, and it drew the cameras of the press outside Down Street on my suit. Now, I have never, ever had such a ghastly suit uh, it was the sort of thing that people wear at race meetings, and uh, we, it was made by the only um, tailor in my constituency, so I couldn't really criticise it very much. Well, anyhow, uh, look, we did it. The referendum result was a triumph, yes. and let, let's remember. <laughs> now, now we must stop the doubters and the moaners from undoing it all. And I had not intended saying a word about the court judgment a few days ago, but I just have to say a couple of words about it because it is now so very relevant. Now, I see no point in railing against it. Let's hope that the Supreme Court overturns it, but I slightly doubtful that it will want to overturn a judgment made by um, by the ma master of the rolls. So, but look, don't let's worry about it because there is a, a majority in the House of Commons for pushing through Article 50. The Tory party, even the Remainers, will back the government. Uh, many of the Labour Party in the Commons will not wish to oppose uh, the pushing through of Article 50. The, the uh, Ulster unionists are on our side, so we will get it through. And I hope there'll be a one-line bill with a timetabling agreement, and the present MPs will have to stay up all night, as I used to do, but now they all go home to bed at 10 o'clock. And they'll have to stay up all night arguing uh, under a timetable motion. I hope it'll be a one-line bill. The problem will be the House of Lords. What do you do with these turkeys? What do you <laughs> I mean, the House of Lords is a frightful mess, and, and how you are going to stop the House of Lords from keeping this thing going forever, I really don't know, but that's not for me. Now, when I was asked to speak at this occasion, I turned it down. I decided that someone in his mid-80s was not the right sort of person to make a speech on Brexit. It was for the younger generation to do so. But, um, but is it Barry? Uh, Robert. Robert Old wrote back to me and said, we really want you because you will show your gravitas. I was really provoked. <laughs> no, no one had ever suggested in all my life that I had gravitas. <laughs> in, indeed, if I had gravitas, I would almost certainly have been a Remainer. Um, so uh, I was offended, and that's why I'm here. <laughs> now, there are obvious risks to Brexit. There are risks to Brexit. If the government, the previous government, had argued the pros and cons in a quiet, rational, logical way, I do think they would have won the referendum. But this project fear did it in for them. I mean, when Osborne claimed that in 15 years' time the average family in this country would be £4,001 worse off in 15 years' time, I thought he'd gone completely bonkers. <laughs> and the Treasury economists will be much better writing Old Moore's Almanac <laughs> than, than producing this kind of stuff. It depends, of course, what you put into your economic model is, is crucial. If you put foolish assumptions into your economic model, you'll get rubbish out the other end, which is exactly what happened. Now, we're going to have a problem in the negotiations. We're going to have a problem in the negotiations because we will be arguing, as Patrick Minford would, on, on the economic and sovereignty issues. But I think that they will be arguing politically. And politics means something quite different to us than to what it means to them. Um, how else would we still have the euro? It's perfectly clear that it's ruinous 
to the southern Europe and all those hundreds and hundreds of thousands of young people who are unemployed, but they carry on regardless. They carry on regardless. The Commission has everything to lose in the negotiations. The Commission has power to lose, influence, their inflated incomes and jobs and pensions. The Commission has everything to lose, although I think the Member States, frankly, have much to gain because we will be introducing the kind of democracy which actually we've been arguing for for the last 30 years and got nowhere. Now, you may think that... Um, you may think of me as a politician, and I've been trying to live that down for the last 35 years. <laughs> I've spent far more time in business and in the city than I ever spent in politics. Um, but I want to give you just one or two of my experiences on the way. First of all, I started my business career, um, I think Patrick mentioned it, in Warburg's. Warburg's no longer exists. Uh, but it was a, a very successful uh, merchant bank in the 60s. And it was in Warburg's when I was there that we single-handedly invented the Eurobond market. Now, the Eurobond market in the 60s actually brought back the prominence of the city of a kind that it had in the 19th century. And ever since, uh, the independence, third-party, regulation-free system, uh, which I think the Eurobond market represented, they tried to undo it, particularly the French and the Commission. And then, in the 1970s, one of the greatest privileges of my political career, I just happened at the time to be Economic Secretary to the Treasury. And when Tony Barber, my boss, the Chancellor, met with Ted Heath to decide what on earth we were going to do about a run on the pound. We, we had them continuously because we had a fixed exchange rate and runs on the pound were very serious at that time. We met together. I, I was one of four people there. And Ted, against all his instincts, was forced to float the pound. Now, I cannot tell you what a great moment that was. A great moment. The economic independence that a floating pound gives us cannot be exaggerated. Uh, there have been aberrations. I'm afraid my friend Nigel shadowed the Deutschmark, a mistake, and then John Major wanted the ERM, an even worse mistake. But now we have a floating pound, and the scaremongering, of course, has forced the pound down lower, probably, than it should have gone. And it ha it'll have its pros and cons. It will help the um, overseas deficit, but it'll have some problems. It will, of course, bring inflation and price rises. And it will force the governor and his coven of technocrats in the Bank of England probably to raise interest rates eventually and stop printing money. And that'll be no bad thing. Uh, but I have to say that the Prime Minister was absolutely right to say what she did at the Conservative conference uh, she's perfectly entitled to complain about short-term uh, short termism in, 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 in monetary policy. Well, then, then we have the election in 79, and I became Trade Secretary, the first one in the Thatcher government. Uh, Michael Heseltine succeeded me. He called himself President of the Board of Trade in his rather grandstanding way. Uh, I, 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 I just called myself Trade Secretary. It was sufficient. But I went backwards and forwards uh, to Brussels, endless meetings about policy. Uh, frankly, I was dealing very often with protectionist member members, and I found it uh, humiliating and counterproductive. And Michael, who is a friend of mine, I, I, it, he strangled his mother's dog. <laughs> I, 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 I can think of plenty of his friends who would deserve that treatment. Now, 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 where do we go from here? Can someone tell me when I go on too long? Uh, where, 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 where do we go from here? I, I must say, I wholly agree with Peter Lilly. We have to make a clear distinction between matters which are for our decision and issues which are subject to negotiation. I think it is sensible initially to adopt the existing body of EU law, which is part of our law anyhow. And if we do that wholeheartedly, because we, 
make changes as soon as we've recovered our sovereignty. When we've recovered our sovereignty, we can make whatever changes we want. But initially, I, I would be against making changes to the existing body of EU law. Because then there's nothing to negotiate there. There's nothing to negotiate. We just accept it knowing that we can change it all later. And of course, as everybody says in this meeting, we should require full access to the European market, tariff-free. And we should grant the same to them. And I think uh, the professor did not say so in so many words. If they put tariffs on against us, I must say I'm very much in favour of us not retaliating. I, I, I don't see any... The, the problem is the Treasury will want the revenue and we'll have to squash them down. That's not unusual. We have to squash them down the whole time. So uh, we go for tariff-free free trade and if for political reasons we have to... Uh, the, the Europeans argue against it, then, of course, as we all agree, we have to go to the WTO arrangements, which Patrick Minford has talked about. I find it really hard to accept... If we keep to tariff-free uh, imports from the EU, that it would be in their interest to provide, to, to provoke retaliation against us. I don't think it would, but you can never tell. I mean, are the European manufacturers, their food producers, their wine producers, are they going to really, um, are they really going to put up tariffs, fearing that we might retaliate? I think not. So, I just want to say a few words about financial services and passporting, uh, where much of the scaremongering is going on. But before I do so, I want to slightly differ, not fundamentally from the last speaker, but I, I really do think that immigration, particularly from Eastern Europe, has been enormously beneficial to our economy. Now, we owe it, of course, to the supporters of our campaign who have seen their real wages undermined and schools and hospitals overloaded, we have to take control, as we always said, would, uh, of immigration. But how we do it, I think, is still quite tricky. Um, in fact, the Polish, which is the largest number of Eastern Europe, uh, the Polish numbers are diminishing anyhow, because Poland is very much richer than it was, and a lot of the Poles are going home. But I look at, I'm afraid, from a rather selfish, subjective point of view, I, I have a farm in Cornwall, and we had 80 acres of daffodils at one stage, which my wife ran, and we had um, 70 to 100 flower pickers every day coming to our farm. And all those flower pickers were locals. They were all local people. Now, I have to tell you, you couldn't recruit any local people to work on the, on the farm. It's too hard, it's too wet, it's too difficult. And all the people working on vegetables in our part of the world are from Eastern Europe, from Bulgaria, uh, from, the, from the, the Baltic states. And um, we have to be very careful how we organize these work permits because it isn't just uh, for unskilled labor. We, we do, we, just, uh, just for skilled labor. We do need unskilled labor too. And we have to find some way in which uh, the gang masters who bring these people in uh, obtain work permits. It's, it's a tricky one, I think, and I'm worried about it. Now, the city. Now, the city um, is overwhelmingly a wholesale market. In so many of these discussions about what will happen to the city, assume that the city is somehow a retail market, that people in the city go out knocking on doors in order to gain business. That isn't what happens. Customers come from all over the world for the city's expertise, for its professionalism, the infrastructure, the time zone, the English language, and the idea that all of this can be replaced or, or switched to Paris or Frankfurt, I think is completely absurd. Now, if Goldman Sachs want to put 100 of their M&A people in Frankfurt or Paris, it's no great loss to this country, frankly. Goldman Sachs would no great loss to me. Uh, and... and <laughs> Uh, I was one of their competitors when I was uh, the chairman of Lazar. Um, but, of course, uh, the M&A people who were, uh, of Goldman Sachs who were earning two or three million pounds a year, they're not going to really enjoy taxes in Paris, are they? And, and they're going to die of boredom in Frankfurt. <laughs> the, 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 danger, the danger is that the financial services will go to New York. 
And how can that be of any benefit to Europe? So I don't believe the ba banks will upheave, up, upheaval on the banks. Uh, they'll be damaging themselves. I don't think it's going to happen. So we need to look at the city's products one by one. And here, I mean, debt to uh, Stanley. Have you heard of Stanley Yasakovich? Uh, anyhow, he, was, he knows more about city markets than, than most. And Stanley went through all these city products one by one. And it's worth quoting him very briefly because this is so much in the centre of this discussion about passporting. We don't need passporting. It, it, it be, it's useful to have it, but it's absolutely not necessary. So, Stanley said in his letter to me, why do we need, well, there's no documented evidence of why the city's wholesale markets will suffer from the loss of passporting. Which of these services requires access? Participation in the interbank market? No. Buying reinsurance at Lloyd's? No. Raising capital in the city through bond and share issues, syndicated credits, etc.? No. Participating in these deals? No. Seeking corporate and MA advice? No. Establishment of branches or subsidiaries relying on home country or Yes. But who establishes branches and subsidiaries on the continent for wholesale, for wholesale services uh, in the digital age? And then he goes on, and then I'll see. Um, he, he raised the threat of the Eurozone somehow repatriating uh, clearing and settlement services for Euro-denominated instruments has been around for a long time. To do so, the Eurozone would have to restrict access to its banks by non-Eurozone non banks. I mean, it just simply won't happen. So I think all the scares about the city are misplaced. I do worry about the Treasury. I, I was in the Treasury at very difficult times, in the so-called barber boom, and, you know, I, I've learned all about cooking the books. I, I know how to cook the books as a treasury minister. Um, it, it was well done. We had to cook the books. The situation was so dire. Uh, but I worry about the treasury because, um, do you know, my, one of my recent heroes was William Hague. I spent so much time helping William uh, to fend off the euro when he was leader of the party. He was a reliable Eurosceptic, and look what's happened to him in the Foreign Office. And the misfortune of our Chancellor is that he spent time in the Foreign Office. So I'm very suspicious of anyone who spent time in the Foreign Office. <laughs> uh, and and, and um, so, so we must watch the Treasury. It, it's jealous of the fact the Treasury institutionally is jealous of the fact that there are other departments now responsible for Brexiting. And the Treasury thinks, particularly under Osborne, it was running the country. And then under Blair, Brown was running the country. Now suddenly the Treasury feels it's been sidelined by the Prime Minister. And it's institutional jealousy which is causing some of these problems. So I conclude uh, by saying this. I must tell you this, and I, I'm really not proud of it, not proud of it at all, that I am allergic, in principle, to all prime ministers. <laughs> I have not been keen on any of them since Margaret Thatcher. Yeah. And, 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 and I used to quarrel a lot with her, but she loved an argument, and one of the many memories I have is sitting through the debate internally in this country uh, about the European budget contribution. Peter Carrington, who was Foreign Secretary, came back eight times uh, uh, seeking the Prime Minister's agreement to uh, the, the revised budgetary contribution. Margaret Thatcher turned down every one of them. But the eighth time I was in these meetings, I thought, my God, you know, how long is this woman going to go on being as obstinate as this? And in the end, she won out uh, because we got a reasonably good uh, agreement on budgetary contribution. But she fought it, she fought it, she fought it. And may I say, uh, I've got nothing against the former Prime Minister, but you know, how anybody could have come back from the European Union with the agreement that he had in his pocket, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> Margaret Thatcher would never have come back from any meeting with that agreement, ever. Now, 
I'm not allergic, I'm not allergic to the Legion, uh, to, to, to Theresa May. I think she has started splendidly, not least by putting the Treasury in its proper place. She, she, she may have to make some concessions on the way, but we, all of us, I think, enthusiastic Brexiteers, must back her all the way, even if she makes some concessions, which she may have to. She is our best hope of coming out of this whole thing with honour, and we hope with her we'll come out of it as a free country again. Thank you.